Hello and good morning, everybody. Today we have a very special webinar for you all. We'll be going over the ins and outs of using drip irrigation. This topic is very important in an ever-changing world where water is more and more a valuable commodity. And who better to speak of this than our very own irrigation specialist, Jake Lott. Before we get started on this, I just wanna go over a couple of items to help you uh, live listeners get the most out of this experience. First, you can exit the full screen in Zoom by either changing the view options located at the top of the screen, or you can simply press the escape key. Also, there is a chat window, as well as a Q&A window located at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves at the chat box, but if you have a question that you'd like Jake to address, please use the Q&A box for that. Now, without further ado, I will hand this over to Jake. Awesome, thank you, Paul. You're so kind. Um, I am Jake Lott. I am the irrigation specialist on staff here and uh, definitely love irrigation. This uh, drip topic is something that we've done in the past for sure. So those of you who have been uh, with us for a while may have heard a lot of this before, but the important thing is, is really to understand the, uh, the ins and outs, like Paul said, about drip irrigation. Um, really how it functions within land effects specifically. So uh, what we're going to really get into um, is how to understand that equipment. And when I, when I say that, I, I really mean just understanding not only the functionality within and how land effects uses it, but really what you're going to be looking for and, and how the system is going to be treating certain pieces of equipment. Uh, we're going to look at how the system categorizes the equipment and maybe a little bit of the terminology is different from what you're maybe used to seeing, but really starting to break that down. And then just going through from beginning to end about adding that equipment, how to place that stuff, and then where we can have the conversation. And I'm I'm going to suggest this throughout the, the presentation today that you guys use the chat window to chat amongst yourselves. Uh, this is a really good time to bounce ideas off of people, um, designers that are actually watching this, seeing how people design. Uh, not only will it help us understand what kind of tools that we need to provide to you guys, but there might be some other tips and tricks that you guys can share with each other. So definitely suggest doing that. And um, really talking about where some of that information goes. Does it go in the plan or does it go into the detail? Does it go into notes? Um, just all good talking points. So before we get too far into things, we did have a recent guest webinar presented by Shelly Walker uh, with GPH Irrigation. And she does go into uh, a lot more depth than we are in this webinar, just about the types of drips, where it's used, what to use, what to think about when you pick that kind of equipment. Um, we're going to be taking basically from assuming you've watched this or understand these concepts and going into now applying that to, to land effects itself. So what I first want to go into is just understanding equipment and what that's going to really entail is just to, to understand whether this equipment is performance driven or really to show on a plan basically for clarification, showing where certain pieces of equipment are showing uh, or the contractor needs to put things um, just from an aesthetic standpoint that might not have a bearing on the actual performance of the calculations that Land Effects is gonna be doing. So if we were going to kind of dump these into specific categories, our performance driven equipment is going to be everything that you would typically see on a plan, something that you're really wanting to show. Um, but then what has some correlating uh, performance data. So our any type of emission device, um, and this does fall outside of the realm of drip, but specifically for drip, we have our bubblers, our emitters, or different spray types, and then our, our drip tubings. And then, of course, we have all of our valves. This doesn't have to be drip kit specifically, but what I want to kind of go a little bit deeper in is understanding those drip kits specifically. Um, but on the flip side, we have additional pieces of equipment that we really do want to show on the plan, but really has no bearing on 
anything that the system is going to do other than being able to auto generate counts and list them in the schedule and those kind of things. Um, but from a performance standpoint, we really know that the a drip indicator isn't going to be uh, needed in calculations, nor are the air relief for flush valves, but those are absolutely crucial to the plan. So just understanding um, the balance between the two is, is kind of important there. So moving into that drip kit valve that I talked about, I'm uh, just going to run through a, a simple scenario just, just so that we are all on the same page from how to actually read uh, these charts. And they're very important. And, you know, we've been working hand in hand with all of the manufacturers on maybe making these easier to read, whether they're table graphs instead of these line graphs. Um, but just understanding what the system really has to be doing and, and function performance wise in order to uh, account for the proper losses in pressure and stuff like that for the system. So if we're going to do a little scenario here and we're picking this 40 PSI uh, valve type, so it's that green line there, and assuming that we actually have about 10 GPM for that valve or that zone, um, and this is assuming that we've designed the system, we've piped it, and we've got about 10 gallons. If we're gonna follow this line straight up you're going to notice that the required dynamic pressure there on the left, um, 20, 30, 40, 50, starting there and, and curving right up towards the 60 mark, um, that is the required pressure for this valve and pressure regulator to work. And if we're going to um, cross-check this against what this actually means, we want this valve to run at 40 PSI. Okay, that's the regulated uh, pressure that this valve is going to do. In order to make it regulate at 40 PSI, this chart is saying that you need about, that required pressure is right there, and it's about 57 if we're going to kind of put a number to it right there. So what that means is there is a difference of 17 PSI that the system needs to account for somewhere. And what we're going to take that uh, to mean, and we can group this different ways, but what the system does automatically is it calculates the zone flow and it figures out the valve loss. And what we're saying, because there's a difference of that 17 PSI, we're technically calling it valve loss. Even though it's required dynamic pressure, you can um, basically see that there is a difference between what is going to be regulated and used versus what is required on the inlet side of that valve. So we're saying that's a, a difference of 17 PSI. So that's very crucial when you're starting to think about how you're zoning your, your system, what kind of valves you're gonna be using, because if in fact that you are going to be losing, quote unquote, this 17 PSI, and you do not have that on the system, then this is an opportunity to look at, maybe I can just simply not use the full drip kit valve, but parts of that drip kit valve, meaning I'm gonna use the valve specifically that would generally be used because there's a lot less pressure loss through a valve at those typical flows. And I can put a filter on it, which I'm bypassing the regulated part because I don't need it. So it's just understanding your equipment, understanding what that actually means and picking the right equipment for the job. Now, when it comes to categorizing equipment, we're gonna kind of go into a little bit of terminology here that lands right within uh, land effects here. So we have our area for drip emitters. We've got custom emitters, so tree rings and, and different sort of maybe custom emitter sets, combinations of an, an amount of emitters that you wanna show with one symbol. We have individual emitters and then we have area for drip line. And those are the main categories, the classifications that we're gonna be looking at. And so you can see by these, these details here of what those kind of mean, you know, what, what kind of instance that would be when you're installing those. Now, from a component side of things, there's definitely going to be um, some commonality here as well. So our drip control valve and the, the filter regulator setup, 
that's obviously what we're you know explaining in that detail there but we also have just a standard valve that could be used um, as well but typically drip valves versus regular valves you want to show differently so there is a different section for those in the system itself we have our drip air relief valves we have our transition points and our flush valves these are all different pieces of equipment and they have a specific function and so how we show that on the plan versus in the detail is very crucial uh, because you can see here that there is a lot of makeup in parts and stuff like that that you might not be showing on the plan itself because it's just graphically not going to read very well um, overall. So um, this is kind of where that lands there. Now I wanted to focus a little bit more on the area for drip emitters because this is something that is represented on the plan as a hatch. But the really, really cool thing about area for drip emitters is it, it, it does have the ability to account for the proper flow without actually cluttering the drawing. So taking the actual container sizes of the plants, assigning the emitters, and um, being able to generate that proper flow is, uh, is super crucial. It is quicker to draft. It's a lot easier to show on a plan um, a bounding polyline with a hatch in the middle to say this is the emitter stuff and then have on the schedule be able to break down how many emitters per container type um, that you're going to want. And of course, it allows us to save that detail for the detail. So what do you want to show for the contractor so that it's easier for him to see exactly how you want to install it? It's a lot easier to show that kind of detail as an example um, within the actual detail cut sheets than it is to try to show every swinging little poly pipe um, going to every plant on the plan because um, more often than not the plan is definitely a graphical representation and as much as we want it to be the be all end all as soon as it goes out onto the site there are going to be changes whether they be minor or not and if we are trying to be so uh, meticulous and and uh, detailed with where we put these lines on the plan it might not um, actually be how it's installed um, on site so giving yourself a little bit of flexibility to um, focus more time here than it is um, on the general plan and of course you know noting the plan for more clarity is always um, a bonus as well but there is a caveat to this. Sometimes this particular piece of equipment won't be the best approach. Um, there definitely are limitations. You know, it has everything to do with your drawing setup and how the system looks for certain items. You might not be in control of the land effects planting plan or a planting plan done in land effects. And these types of things um, do limit or um, Kind of put up a little bit of a barrier on when you can actually use this um, product but at the same time this uh, this is one piece that has several wish list items that uh, are going to be able to make it even more flexible to use so just keeping that in mind as well so i want to take this time just to remind everybody um, to get your questions in we're going to get over so that we can start uh, really playing in the program here, but please, please send in those questions so that we can try to get those in on time. Um, but we're going to just jump right into it here. So uh, what we have here, um, I've got a little plan set up um, and I've got my irrigation manager docked over to the side. And of course, we've got uh, uh, an important part to this, especially when we're working with our, um, our hatches and our drip areas is we definitely want to, um, and our symbols and stuff like that, we definitely want to set up the scale properly because everything irrigation, as you probably know, does depend on our scale. So um, I've got all that kind of set up already. And there are two things that I really want to kick off with just, just right off the bat so that um, I don't have to necessarily go back here, but 
um, we've got a couple new features and something to think about as you um, you know think about your guys's workflow and, and however you design drip but in your irrigation preferences if you open up your irrigation preferences and this does pertain to a specific preference set so um, we have two new options we have a drip line hatch that's scaled at row spacing so again if you want to show that clarity on the plan and you're using the area for drip line there's an ab the ability now to have the hatch automatically scale to specifically the row spacing of that drip equipment so that's it's actually pretty cool um, and as that drip row spacing might change or you adjust it the hatch changes as well and then this newest one including the perimeter um, in, in the drip line flow calcs so if we're actually using this area for drip line again and we offset our typical workflow is to offset that um, bounding hatch line so that we can incorporate additional flow around the perimeter of, of that so that it is fully covered um, emitter wise then this guy will add that additional flow calc in to um, to the calculations there so it, the caveat is that you do want to make sure that you're offsetting that line appropriately and to the the manufacturer's specs so that you're not over compensating for the flow amount that gets put to that area there um, this is a really great um, option too if you're going to be you know doing the actual uh, drip lines underneath turf and you want to put a, an, a circle of uh, or a linear foot of pipe around the perimeter as well so that you're fully covered Again, just little features that you guys have requested that we're putting in there to just make it all that easier. So just wanted to show that those were on as I was doing my calculations here. So, um, and, and just to go to uh, the irrigation manager here, this is where all of our drip components are gonna be. So from the control valves to the accessories to the types of drip that we're gonna be placing is all here. The one thing that does land in our head section is the bubblers. So um, those are more of the overhead watering style typically. So it, it does land there. But um, just keep in mind that as we are doing this, we are going to be over here in the drip for the most part. And then if we're looking up in our ribbon, we have our drip toolbar here that has all of our emitters and stuff like that there. Our standard obviously has that bubbler just like it is in the irrigation manager. So without further ado, we're going to just add a couple pieces of equipment um, just so that we have them. Um, and want to just start with the most basic, simple drip emitter um, for now. This is going to be a just a point source. This is going to be something that uh, you're going to be placing individually around the plan. So, uh, Again, you're gonna have all of your different manufacturers that you're gonna pick from, but I'm actually gonna make um, a custom one right off the bat. And this custom one, while we set our pressure, this custom one is gonna be um, our tree ring de uh, drip emitter here. This is gonna be custom. I know that I want three rings of, of inline drip tubing, so we're gonna go three ring, just something like that. And the description is going to be very, very important as you start to set these up because you can start to set up a database of custom drip emitters with different flows and, and all kinds of stuff. And you want to make sure that you have some type of description telling you how you came up with that flow, basically. So um, when it comes to that, definitely... Uh, try to be as detailed as possible. So this was the 0.9 GPH at the 12 inch on center emitter spacing. And my calculated GPH was 45. Now, this is an important step right here because as soon as we say okay to this, um, the GPH is locked. It is not editable at the moment. Um, 
So make sure that you're setting these up right. If you made a mistake, it's as simple as deleting it and adding another one back. Um, but it's also good if you had to change the flow that you just make a new one to begin with because then you would have a database of all your varying tree rings and it'll be good to go. The symbol here is definitely something you can set. Make your own custom ones if you want to or one of our uh, generic ones. So say okay to that. And we can even then set details specific to this item because a lot of times this emitter is just going to be a graphical representation and we're not going to show all the detail of that little guy around the tree. So being able to um, have an actual detail that um, goes over that. So you can see I've got um, my little project set up with all my details that I'm going to use here. And you can see that this is my little drip rings based on the specimen plantings that I want to do. So um, this is good enough for me. I'm going to say OK, assign him, and say OK. So now he's in here. It's going to be as easy as double clicking from the manager here um, or going up and placing from there. My preference is just simply double click and come in here and, and place it in there. So you can see now that I have placed that item. If I edit this piece of equipment now, you're gonna see, if I actually click on the right one, you're actually gonna see it converts it automatically to GPM. So now this is really awesome because, um, you know, drip as a whole is generally done by GPH. But when you're sizing your system and, and labeling your valves and stuff like that, it's generally done as GPM. So it's doing all the conversions for us um, for that particular item. So uh, makes it really nice. One really fun feature that I wanna just get out of the way here is I'm actually going to um, open this XREF here and I'm going to um, use a planting feature real quick and I'm gonna highlight this plant. And that plant is across the board, you know, over this area. And these are all the trees that I want to put that tree ring around. Um, so I'm gonna basically use the highlight tool, press S to make a selection. And then I'm gonna copy with base point, just a zero, zero. And I'm gonna close this guy back up. And I'm gonna paste at zero, zero. And you're gonna see it pasted those trees. Now they're live in the drawing here. And what I wanna do is I wanna use our match properties tool. So I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna click on that tree ring that I brought in, but I'm gonna click on one of these plants and then I'm gonna window across the whole deal. And you can see that it automatically converted all of those trees to my actual emitters. So instead of sitting there and placing one each individual, it took that same insertion point of those trees and made it emitters. So talking about like speeding up the process in which we want to actually lay stuff out, uh, we have some really cool tools to do that. So, um, so that's sort of the custom tree ring. We can obviously go ahead and add a regular drip emitter if we wanted to. Um, and and kind of see this. Now, here's um, when we were talking about that area for drip emitter and why it might not function, is we have these multi-ports available or these manifolds available that house additional amounts of flow and the ability to put several different tubes so that you can space them you know, through the plan. The system, when we actually do this, and we'll go ahead and add the area for drip emitter now, so we can see this. Oops. I should actually uh, get rid of him so that I can place him new. All right, so uh, for that specific item, we'll go back here so you can see this. If we were to pick this multi-port as the drip emitter area equipment, it's assuming each one of these, so as a whole, this multi-port would get assigned to one of the actual 
container sizes, which would not be accurate, right? We don't want one whole thing to be put to one specific plant because one specific plant might only have a half a gallon. But this is assuming whatever you place is going to get all six of those ports or all eight of those ports. So this scenario or this equipment would not be great um, for the drip emitter area. It is going to be something that you're going to look for that specific single guy here because we are going to be assigning. So if we add him to the project, we are going to be assigning how many emitters are going to go to um, each container size and what size those are going to be. So for my flats, maybe I want one half gallon per plant in that flat. Maybe I'm using a one gallon for those guys, fives. And, and again, this is going to be based on your knowledge of what plant material was put in at what container size. And um, it, it is something that is on the list already to consider whether we do plant type specifically or water requirements specifically or looking at a specific user field to assign versus the container size. But as it sits right now, this is what it is. So if you have a unique um, instance of plant types and you do not, and they're all, um, there's several versions of a five gallon with high, medium or low water, water use, you can set up different container sizes that says five gallon low, five gallon medium, five gallon high, and assign them that way. That is definitely a good workaround, um, but something that we're gonna try to account for um, down the line there. So for right now, we're gonna just go ahead and assign a few things. Now, as we get into the bigger trees, and this is such a common thing that we zone our trees differently than our shrubs and our ground covers. Um, we have a couple different options. One, depending on the actual container size of the trees, just simply don't assign emitters to those and the system will not recognize them. Or two, go ahead and um, create, because again, you might have some 15 gallon shrubs. So go ahead and create a container size um, specifically for trees so that they don't get assigned as well. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you um, a couple other things in just a little bit here. So we're gonna ignore those guys, but we're gonna have um, these guys kind of assigned there. We'll say, okay, and he gets added to our project. So now I can go ahead and I can place um, this here in and place it onto a polyline. Now, when it comes to drawing setup and, and kind of properly doing this stuff, I could draw on the fly if I wanted to and start, you know, just building that line up, but I don't want to do that. I want to be able to kind of follow this perimeter of that, uh, that planter bed there that I've got going on. And if I had all my line work in one drawing with my plants in the drawing as well, it, it does create somewhat of a, a pain to try to do that. So when we talk about proper, um, setup and, and whatnot, it's X-refing things properly so that your base file is nice and clean that I can come in here and, and generate a boundary if I need to. So I can go ahead and do boundary is one of my favorite commands and that generally works really well. Um, so going uh, uh, in that route, oh, oh. try that again going that route and filling this area should be as, as easy as that. And of course, as we're showing it live, it wants to take its time. So we'll try that one more time. Paula, are there any questions while we do this? Oh yeah, there was a couple that came in. Um, and I'm not sure if this is something you're showing, but uh, Daniel Brannon asked if it would be possible to have the area for drip emitter look at water requirements rather than container size to calculate the flow. Um, being that his example is um, 
he's got a, a yucca plant and a, a, a rose uh, in the same bed, it seems. And uh, obviously they have different water requirements. So is there something that addresses that? Yeah, so just like I talked about earlier, that is a pending wish list item. So the way he has it set up now, um, creating those different container sizes is definitely going to be the best approach um, and and work the best as it sits right now. But the goal is to have the ability to either look at a different user field or the plant requirements altogether. So it's uh, the his ideas are are welcome. If he has um, somewhat of a, a mock-up he could um, give as, as sort of the functionality is concerned, because we do have to kind of create that to see if it functions that way. So ideas are welcome for sure. Send it in to us. All right, very cool. And um, Travis Walker wants to know, uh, when you copy and paste new trees into the drawing, use the match properties on it to get that data. Um, should you delete those initially placed plants? Nope, those plants automatically are not plants anymore and they are the bubblers. So you don't delete anything um, at all, ever. So you'll notice I turned off, uh, turned off that, that XREF there. And those are all the placed plants. The plants should be, you know, a part of what the planting design is still, but the ones that we copied in are now actual bubblers. So um, bubblers, root zone, uh, emitters, tree rings, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're now sprinklers instead of trees. So no deleting anything. So, um, but yeah, so, so if we're going to go ahead and place this guy um, into this area, you can see that it generates a nice little hatch pattern here. Um, it puts it on the proper layer. But what's nice about this is if we go ahead and we look at this flow here, you can see that it automatically generated all of my flow without me having to place each individual symbol and number of symbols across the board. Um, it's automatically going to uh, change based on container size, the amount in there. And uh, if we were to go ahead and run a schedule real quick, sort of out of order, but want to show you what that actually looks like on the, the schedule here is you have a breakdown not only of the total square footage area, but the emitter notes of, okay, so I've got um, five gallons and I've got the flats that are in that area specifically. So um, it does generate the actual quantity of the emitters for that item so um, makes it really really nice the breakdown is is awesome um, for that purpose so now maybe we let's go ahead and we can use this um, this guy here and we're going to offset him six inches so this is going to be now our new offset line we're going to go ahead and add that uh, area for drip line now so same thing, area for drip line. And if we're gonna go ahead and just pick something here. This is also something that's been cleaned up and new. So we don't have a, as many options to pick from now. It's a lot simpler to see what your actual series is that you're gonna look for. We're gonna go ahead and pick him and this list is a lot shorter. What we're only focusing on here and, and there's an assumption to be made that you can change after the fact, but um, we're looking at flow and emitter spacing. That's it. So if I'm looking for a, a 9.9 uh, .9 and a 12 inch emitter spacing in the tubing itself, this is the guy I'm gonna go for. I'm gonna pick his pressure and now he's here. So if I were to edit this piece of equipment, you'd see that automatically a row spacing cell now becomes live and I can actually change that if I wanted to um, to make my row spacing more uh, general for what that area is going to be like and you'll notice that it automatically changes based on the numbers that we put here in this and again we can change the emitter spacing after the fact too but for our point we're going to go ahead and say okay to that 
and we're just simply going to place. Now, here's the nice part about this hatch pattern, and this is the one that I favor the most. Um, it's the most easy to use, is depending on the line that I click on, um, it's going to actually direct the hatch pattern in that position. So if I wanted it to actually be um, more up and down and follow the, the majority of, of these areas, that's what I could actually do. So in something like this, I could simply pick him and it would follow this. Now, obviously we've got some differences in, we really wouldn't pipe this guy like this. So we are limited to what CAD hatch functionality is. So if we wanted to break this up, or if it was simply just a too big of an area, let's say uh, down here, this might've been too big of an area. So let's check out the flows for these. So 22 gallons, that's, if we're looking and, and thinking about that chart that we saw, and even at 10 gallons, um, we were losing, uh, you know, 17 pounds of loss. We're close to 18 gallons. And maybe I wanted to keep my zones more in the 10 gallon range. Um, how do we split those up? You know, it's a, it's a very challenging thing, especially to take, um, you know, the, the hatch patterns and that kind of stuff and break it up into its own thing. So um, this is going to be a tool that uh, is, we'll call it moderately new, but not totally new. Um, but polydivide. Polydivide is probably one of my favorite little commands and it does have its quirks. It is trying to do a lot of different calculations automatically, finding geometric centers and stuff like that. So depending on the shape, and how you're trying to cut it, it might not like it. So it's something to play around with to start getting familiar with. But say we wanted to actually break the middle up from these little um, island and fingers here. I'm gonna just type, I have a, a, an alias set to PD, but poly divide is, is also something that you can type. Okay. So it's gonna ask to select an object. So we're gonna go ahead and click this hatch pattern here. And the nice part of this is it recognizes that it's flow and it recognizes um, a potential breakdown of, do you wanna divide this into equal segments? And so you can see what the GPM would actually be if we were to break these into equal segments here. And again, caveat being, depending on how you try to divide those segments, um, it will say yes or no, but I actually want to split along a specified segment here. And I'm just going to pick, because um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pick directly in line with this, but if I go just to over that, um, that edge there, in a click of a button, you're going to see that it auto cut and filled um, and joined back those specific items. So if I were to look at this um, overall flow here, it is now reduced. Um, and I look at this flow here, he's now based on this, which makes it nice because I can simply place him on this line again and show the row spacing this way. Now, obviously this is at 18 inch on center spacing and the hatch looks, um, you know, okay, but obviously if you wanted it differently, you would have to manually start to adjust those things a little bit. But that command is super, super cool, um, especially if you're trying to um, split and, and cut up areas um, specifically to that. So you can see that it just cut right where my crosshair was or my, my crossing angle was there. So um, I can grab that, go ahead and place them on, on there again reposition him and now I've got three different areas that I could still pipe to to one zone if I wanted to um, but to be able to show the hatches differently um, it is uh, it is really really cool there so um, same thing might go to you know the areas like this this big right here where we needed to just simply um, split the flows just to be more even. So that's splitting evenly with two. And my crossing line is going to be, let's say right here. 
this is a perfect example. It does not know where that geometric center is, so it couldn't sort of calculate that. You can try running, running it to see if, uh, if you can find it with it all zoomed out and cutting it this way. And so you're gonna get these different messages and these messages are telling you that, look, you, it's trying to do this um, very, very complicated um, shimmy of, of flows and stuff like that to cut it. And just based on this weird shape, um, it's not gonna be able to do that. So, um, so again, use it with discretion, but uh, it, can, it can really save a lot of time. Um, so, uh, before I move on any further, I see a few questions coming in. Do we want to handle those right now, Paul? Yeah, I was, I was going to chime in while you're still on the poly divide. Um, Travis Walker I was also asking if the poly divide command can be used for zoning heads. Zoning heads. I'm not quite sure I understand that. If, if I'm understanding correctly, that's for regular sprays and stuff like that to see how much flow should be on a certain zone. And if that's the case, we do have our circuiting tool that we're not gonna fully go over, but this gives you the ability to drop a polyline around an area to see what the total flows are um, in that respect. So if he wants to be more clear, that'd be great. But uh, yeah, sure, uh, give him some time if he if, uh, wants to clarify on that note a little bit. Um, but Julie Riddle uh, asked a question on uh, drip rings for tree irrigation. Uh, she asked if, if they're current or consistently using drip rings for tree irrigation, irrigation, is there a way to place the tree symbol and the tree drip ring symbol at the same time? Um, no, that's a good question. My answer to that would really be your planting plan should be different than your irrigation plan to begin with. So you're gonna be doing your actual planting plan um, in one file and you should xref that in and simply make a copy of the plan that you can just simply do the match properties and uh, it'll take a few clicks but it'll keep everything separate um, and graphically done proper so um, i i would say that's that's your best bet there so um, all right, so we're gonna just keep on going here. So we have time to, to do some other fun stuff. Now, um, as we get into these specific types of areas, these hatches and how we pipe to those, we might as well add a, uh, add a drip control valve real quick so we can uh, show that. And again, we're just, I'm just picking one, but uh, feel free to, to choose from the list. Um, what we got going on. And so we're gonna add him to the project. All right. And we're gonna go ahead and just place him. So I've, I've just placed the, the main line around. So I'm just gonna put a couple, uh, couple deals in here. When it comes to piping, especially when we have these areas, what's something that, you know, we can use from a clarity standpoint uh, so that it's a little easier to know what the zone is doing, what the system is trying to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and place just a couple more uh, of these areas in here. All right. And I'm actually gonna place, I'm gonna use our match, match equipment here. I'm gonna grab that little emitter that we did and I'm just going to place a couple extra rings um, through there. So we've got a zone um, in this island bed and I've got my tree zone uh, that's going to be eventually on one and I've got all my other stuff on um, on this other zone here and if I look at this actual hatch here I've got 10.29 gallons, okay, for this total area here. But you're gonna notice if I go ahead and connect, now this is, you know, connect the dots for me at this point in time, but um, however you're going to actually pipe to these and how you wanna graphically show that, totally up to you. 
but um, for bubblers specifically, we're going to have to, or emitters specifically, we're going to have to pipe to each one. And so taking that lateral tool, clicking on each one and getting back to the valve so that um, they're actually connected into a, into a series there. But I'm actually going to do a info on this guy again. And you can see my GPM dropped. And this is where it gets really cool. And, and just so that you start to understand what the system's actually doing. Um, is the system from a drip emitter standpoint does recognize any additional emitters that you might have placed in this area. So if I had um, a new drip emitter and we went and we grabbed, you know, some of these guys here. And these were the sizes that I had to place. So um, I can pick from this. And this is again, one of those a little bit newer features, which is kind of cool is I have the ability to choose what that symbol set's gonna kind of look like um, on the plan for my different stuff. If I had a type of equipment um, that allowed positions like a fixed arc micro spray with a quarter, a half or a full, um, I could choose this option down here and have that symbol position in the direction of spray as well. So another great little feature that has been integrated into um, the placing of. So we'll say, okay, there he is. So if I were to go ahead and just place, maybe I just needed a couple extra gallon emitters in some of the areas to, to be accounted for. And I looked at this actual hatch again. You're going to see that he has bumped up just a little bit um, to to be based on on that additional flow there. So um, it really does make it nice uh, to simply place a couple additional stuff and not have to actually pipe to any of those emitters, but know that the flows are actually being accounted for within that area. So now I can simply take my other valve and pipe into this area. And uh, when I go ahead and we should just call these out so you can see the flows change on the fly. When I actually size this guy, you can see that there's his, his new flow for that area here. Um, and, and we don't have to go ahead and pipe to all those. Now, the nice thing again, if we're going to actually be zoning these properly and, and wanted to, to maybe account for those things, as soon as I start piping to any one of those additional um, emitters, and I go ahead and I size this pipe again, he's gonna automatically adjust and take off the flows that now no longer are just hanging out in those areas. So, so really, really um, flexible on that kind of stuff. And to answer Steve, yes, I can function through some of the valve stuff simply with a call out. So I don't have to click on the valve. That goes for sizing and verifying and different things like that, so. Um, all right, so this is all fine and dandy and we can just drop a piece of pipe end into this area. And I can go ahead and I can take from that fitting and I can come up here and I can go over here, the worst routed thing in the world here. And I wanna connect to that area too. So I've come over here and I've come over to here. Well, if you see this and we're gonna use our highlight tool you're gonna see that I highlighted, and it's only highlighting this little area now. It's actually not even recognizing this area. And that's because we need to have an endpoint, an open end pipe, or our pipe transition point um, in the area for it to be recognized, okay? So if this happens and you're going to go ahead and pipe to all of these different areas, wherever you land and whatever fitting 
lands within that area, an open end fitting is the only area that it's going to be recognized to. So if I wanted all three of these to be connected, I would need to grab my lateral tool and I would need to drop a little piece of pipe so that it recognized, hey, I want to come into this area. So now if I were to highlight this guy, you're going to see that now all three of these are connected. It's finding the proper flows and I could size my uh, size my valve again and it will then account for all three of those areas. So furthermore, in an area like this, now how how would we be piping to an area like this? Um, you know, totally again up to you. Do we have that uh, supply header um, or that exhaust header? What is that pipe connection going to be doing? Where are those um, endpoints going to be? Totally up to you. But if you think about it this way, each one of these open end connections is kind of the uh, if we're going to look at, and let's just jump over to a detail here. If we're going to look at that transition point, we're coming under the ground and we're coming up to start feeding that blank tubing to the single point emitters, that kind of stuff. This is what we're really accounting for as that open end or that pipe transition point there. So if we go back over to here, let's go ahead and add really quick a pipe transition point. Gonna get over to the, the right section there. And we're just gonna do a generic one. And we could have, we have a couple different options. It's really how you wanna show it, but uh, I'm just gonna go with that guy. So this is my preferred method to pipe to these areas with a pipe transition point or place a pipe transition point where I intend to run from my lateral up to this point where I'm gonna um, start running my blank tubing and, and stuff like that, or my inline tubing. So as I put him into the system, and for cleanliness sakes, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete my pipes there. Okay, so you get this nice little radius um, target area here, and this really helps me identify what my total lengths of run of drip line would end up being um, if I say only put one on the very end. Could I, uh, again, understanding the equipment that I'm using, could I get by with putting one on the end and feeding it all the way down this line? Does that fall within the recommended uh, max run distances of your drip tubing? Um, if so, then yes, that's great, place it. I personally like to have the same kind of outlook from where I stub up to these areas as I do with any kind of um, irrigation. And that's really cover your corners um, in a sense. And what I mean by that is whether I'm center feeding or making sure that I'm covered in all aspects of the bed within reason, um, I would be putting in you know, a, a pipe transition point as we come here to start center feeding from here. But I would also personally like to potentially put one in a few other areas so that I connect them all together. And this might be a little overdue for this uh, or overdone for this little spot, but to prove the point that I just simply want to make sure that my lateral pipes come over to these areas so that they feed water up to the surface and that I can loop that whole grid together. Um, so if anything ever gets cut in any one of those places, I am gonna be, I have a water source that would technically still work, albeit um, damaged. So, um, so yeah, center feed is obviously gonna always be the best um, for, for those particulars so that you're really maximizing that. But what this allows us to do is Go ahead and simply click on the uh, on the those pipe transition points, okay? And they connect just like uh, a no normal head would. And so I can simply go through here and and connect to those. And what you'll notice is if I highlight that guy, 
he is now all highlighted still. The nice thing about these pipe transition points is they do show up in the schedule, which means that I have a more accurate count of additional pieces of equipment that I'm going to need from uh, um, tying into the actual tubing and stuff like that. But I can simply take and place, you know, one of these in each of these areas and instead of having to tee off into those areas, I can simply just touch into those and the system recognizes those as being a part of the of the drip area that it wants to water, which means I don't need to worry about all the little fittings and or all the little pipe pieces and stuff like that. It just is automatically recognized. So if I were to size this pipe one more time, he's obviously not going to change um, uh, flow wise and stuff like that. But here's the cool part is based on these connection points and specifically these endpoints, um, I have a total flow um, in this area of 8.2. If I were to look at this piece of pipe right here, I've got 2.06. And if you take that and you multiply it across the four, you can kind of assume that that's actually going to be the total flow. So not only does the system, the number of points that it recognizes here is actually splitting the total flow of those areas into those particular um, transition points. So I could have a more accurate gauge of, of what a, we'll call it quote unquote loop system would technically be because it's sharing the flow between all of those different points, which means it's going to start sizing my pipes uh, uh, probably a little bit more accurate um, from, from that respect there. So it does make it really, really awesome for that. So uh, really to hit home um, the actual piping of that stuff. Now to assign the details to these particular items, because again, this does help show where I'm going to be stubbing up, but obviously from a um, drip emitter standpoint, how do I show the contractor what's happening there is I simply can assign these guys details. And so if we go back over to my project and we look at um, this, we can preview it. This is what I kind of want to show the contractor. Okay, hey, in these areas, this is really what you're going to start looking at. Um, and this combined with the schedule that shows the number of emitters to what container size is really going to um, sort of hit home what your intent is. So we'll go ahead and say, okay. So now he's actually assigned um, I can further, if I wanted to, throw a call out onto this. So if we were going to take that, um, where is it at? This guy here. And just simply point to this area. You can see that he's going to go ahead and be assigned. And, and obviously, I've placed him on the sheet so he knows exactly where he is they can now follow this, see what your intent is, see what you're actually going to be doing in areas like this. You can see that this is where we are placing flush valve and there's a note for an air relief valve. Okay, so we can do that, you know, add those types of things to the plan. But talking about the aesthetics of things versus functionality, what's going to actually be um, you know, your goal here. So we added that piece of equipment. So if I'm just going to simply place these guys in those low areas, in the areas here, that has no bearing on anything performance data wise. But again, it's that additional piece of information that we can place on the plan um, that when we run the schedule, we know that everything is going to be accounted for automatically here. Um, in the plan. So we have our pipe transition points, our valves, our flush valves, um, those kind of uh, additional single guys, our tree ring stuff, and then again the breakdown of, of everything else um, that way. So um, have time for like a couple questions if we've got them. Um,
get your questions in and, and we'll try to get them answered, guys. Okay. Um, so uh, referring back to that initial uh, Travis's question about the uh, using the poly divide tool, um, he wants to know if, if you have, if you would like to have uh, multiple zones of equal flow, can you place all heads or pipe all heads together and then use poly divide to divide them equally? Yeah, so so no is the answer, um, but that does fall into one of our wish list items. I think that would um, help uh, do what you're asking it to do. Um, and that would be a part of our circuit tools. And we have um, a couple pending things to try and find where the center of zones would be so that they are evenly dispersed um, so that you can pipe them that way. So, so there are a few things that might get you closer to that. But again, the circuit zones are there to help you structure your zones evenly. And you can run a report that way so that you can see where you're heavier or where you're lighter so that you can uh, pipe them appropriately. The problem with piping everything together the system is is looking for data points to particular heads and stuff like that. So if you start piping to things and then start moving things around, you, you have a potential to to break a, a few things. So you gotta be just a little bit careful with that. Okay, and then uh, Brian Patrick wanted to know if uh, you have multiple points of connection, can you size the main line without having to zoom out and navigate the water meter? Yes, um, not drip related, but yes, if you have multiple POCs, it'll ask you to pick a POC, or if you right click, it'll do all of them. So it'll just go one by one um, that way. So um, just know that multiple POCs on a loop, on the same loop, is not sharing the, the load, it's sizing one after another. So it's not, uh, it might not be the exact, information you're looking for, but but the short answer is yes. So, and it looks like that's all the questions. So if you guys have any other questions, please, please reach out to us. Um, if you have any recommendations or um, additional items and suggestions, also shoot them our way. Um, Steve Cook has been awesome in the chat there, showing uh, suggestions and, and uh, the ref note system is absolutely a, an additional way um, to show a lot of those additional pieces that you might want to show um, on a plan, whether they're the um, the supply headers and the exhaust headers and stuff like that. A lot of cool different ways and just letting you know down the pipeline, we are going to be adding a lot of those features into our pipe data to be able to um, have the a drip section for the headers and stuff like that but even in the meantime feel free to use one of the unused pipe classes set it up as as a blank tubing so that you can literally um you know play play with the uh just blank tubing and limit your size list and and connect to stuff that way as well and uh see how that functions for you i've done it in a few projects myself and and it seems to actually be pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, with that, everybody have a great weekend and uh, be safe out there.